But I want to share something with you folks today that we've talked about in the past. But I've met many, many Christians since I've been saved. I was saved in January of 1984. I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior back then. And I've had many discussions with many Christians on many occasions. And I have asked many questions of many people. And most of the questions that I have asked have always been about the Bible. They've always been about the Word of God itself. And the Word of God itself has produced more questions for man than any other book that has ever been written. And more, has produced more questions than any other book that I've ever studied that has ever been written. And the Word of God, of course, is by far the most fascinating book in the entire world, by far. Now, I would ask some questions today. I will ask some questions, just questions, with no answers. And there's a reason for that. Now, I've asked many questions before. And when I asked the questions from people, or to people, I did not receive any answers. But when I gave the answer, a lot of people says, oh yeah, I knew that. And made me wonder, well, I wonder if they really knew it, or if they're just saying that. So I'm going to produce some questions today that demand answers. Questions that you may have thought yourself or thought of yourself, but you didn't have the answers to, well, you won't get any answers today. This DVD is going to be designed exclusively to produce questions. Some of them will be difficult. I know that I've read the Word of God for many years. I've studied the Word of God. And like many other Christians, I have been perplexed by things that sometimes the Bible says one thing here and then it says something different over here and I say, huh, that's strange. And I used to ask myself those questions and I used to wonder why the Bible was like that. So to be fair with anyone listening to these questions today, these questions are not designed to cause you to doubt the Word of God, although these questions have been asked by many doubters in the past. But they're not designed to create confusion. They are designed to unconfuse. Like I say, some of these questions can be confusing if you don't understand the Word of God rightly divided. But Bible doubters and Bible skeptics have always asked questions about the Bible. And they usually don't produce the answers. But the entire purpose of this exercise today is to challenge your thinking and hopefully to motivate you to become more diligent in your study of the Bible. And so I know that there are some people who will say, yeah, go ahead. Ask me some questions. I like a challenge. Well, I will give you a challenge today. Guaranteed. So, I'm going to just ask a whole bunch of questions now and see if you know the answers. So let's begin. In the last part of Genesis chapter 11, why did God call Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees? In Genesis 12, what promises did God make to Abraham? When did the nation of Israel begin? Before Israel was a nation, were the only people in the world Gentiles? What covenants did God make with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Did those covenants include 
the Gentile nations? Did God leave the Gentile nations to themselves after he separated Abraham unto himself, or did he bless them also? In Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, why did God tell Moses that he would make a kingdom of priests out of the whole nation of Israel? Why were they going to become a kingdom of priests? Why did God tell King David that his kingdom would have no end? Has that promise ever been fulfilled? In the Gospels, why did God break the 400-year silence between Malachi and Matthew with the ministry of John the Baptist? What message did John the Baptist preach, and who was it for? Who was it addressed to? Why was John the Baptist baptizing people in the Jordan River? Where did John the Baptist get his instructions to baptize people in the Jordan River? Did he make that up? Or did he read it in the Old Testament? If he did read it in the Old Testament, what book did he read it in? And what chapter and verse was it? Why did John the Baptist baptize the Lord Jesus Christ? What did Jesus Christ mean when he told John that he must be baptized of him to fulfill all righteousness. Was John the Baptist's water baptism an example to members of the body of Christ to be baptized and how to do it? Did the body of Christ exist when John the Baptist was baptizing in the Jordan River? Is there a difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. How would you recognize if someone was preaching the gospel of the kingdom today? Did Jesus Christ preach the gospel of the kingdom or did he preach the gospel of the grace of God? Do we who are members of the body of Christ, obey all the commandments that Jesus Christ gave to his 12 apostles? Did Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry come for the Gentiles? Why did Jesus Christ tell his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, go not into the way of the Gentiles? And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why in Matthew 15 did Jesus Christ tell the Syrophoenician woman that he was not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Why did he tell his disciples that they would sit on 12 thrones with Christ judging the 12 tribes of Israel? Why did Jesus Christ tell his disciples to sell everything they had, but we in the body of Christ don't have to sell everything we have? Why did Jesus Christ perform miracles in the Gospels? Why did the disciples after the resurrection, go forth in the early chapters of the book of Acts and perform miracles themselves. Why is it that in Luke chapter 18 and verse 34, the disciples of Christ did not understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Why was it that Jesus Christ told Zacchaeus 
in Luke chapter 19, verses 8 and 9, that salvation had come to his house because he was a son of Abraham. Why is it that after Jesus Christ was raised from the, from the dead, he told them to begin their ministry at Jerusalem? Why was it that after his resurrection, that his disciples, after spending 40 days with him, the first question they asked him was, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Acts chapter 1. What did Jesus Christ mean when he said to the twelve, As my Father hath sent me, so send I you? How was Christ sent? by the Father. Why is it that the first order of business in the book of Acts was to find a replacement for Judas Iscariot? Why is it that when you arrive at Acts chapter 12 and Herod kills James that no replacement is sought for him? Why is it on the day of Pentecost that Peter addresses the men of Israel, the men of Judea, the leaders of the people, and never once even thinks of addressing the Gentiles? Did Joel prophesy about the body of Christ? When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 16 and said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, was he referring to the birthday of the church, the body of Christ? After spending three years with Jesus Christ and being personally trained by him, talking about the 12 disciples, after they spent three years with Christ and were personally trained by him, why is it that in Acts chapter 9, God saves Saul of Tarsus, who became or who becomes the Apostle Paul? In other words, why Paul? Why was it that after Paul was saved, 14 years later, 14 years after his salvation, according to Galatians chapter 2, the disciples of Christ were still in Jerusalem and had not moved from there and had done nothing to propagate the gospel of the grace of God. Did Peter, James, and John preach the same message as Paul? Did Peter, James, and John agree with Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, 7 through 9? Did they not agree that they, Peter, James, and John, would go to the circumcision, Israel, and that Paul would go to the uncircumcision, Israel? the heathen. Did they agree to do that? If so, why? Are the circumcision and the heathen the same people? Why did Paul, after 14 years of preaching, have to go to Jerusalem, according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, and communicate unto the twelve disciples of Christ that gospel which he preached among the Gentiles. When people asked Peter in Acts chapter 2, what shall we do? Did Peter say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? Did Peter say, 
For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Did Peter, when he was asked, what shall we do? Did he say, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us? Did Peter say that in Christ, through faith in his blood, you have the forgiveness of sins? Or did Peter say, when he was asked, what must I do? Repent, be baptized, and you'll get the Holy Spirit. When someone asked Paul, what must I do? Did Paul say, repent, be baptized, and you'll get the Holy Spirit? Or did Paul say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved? Did Paul say, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Did Paul say, not by works of righteousness which ye have done, but according to his mercy he saved you? Did Paul say, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ? Why did Peter in Acts chapter 10 and verse 35 say, but in every nation... He that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And why did Paul say in Ephesians 1.6 that we're accepted in the beloved by faith? Why did Peter say we're accepted by God by works? And Paul said we're accepted by God by faith. I ask you again, did Peter and Paul preach the same message? Why did Peter say in Acts 2.30 that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead to sit on the throne of David? Why did Paul say in Romans chapter 4 and verse 25 that Christ was raised from the dead for our justification? So I ask you again, did Peter and Paul preach the same message? Why does Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, speak of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ? And Paul speaks of the grace that has already come to you who are members of the body of Christ. So I ask again, did Peter and Paul preach the same message? Did James and Paul preach the same message? Why does Paul, in his letters, always begin by addressing the body of Christ? Why does James begin his letter by addressing the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. If you are a Gentile, are you one of the 12 tribes? Why does Paul in Romans 3.28 say that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law? And why does James in chapter 2 verse 24 say, you see then, how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Do Paul and James preach the same message? Do Paul and John preach the same thing? Why does Paul say that we are not under the commandments? And John in 1 John chapter 1 says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Why did Paul 
in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, say that God did not give the commandments so you could keep them. He gave the commandments to show you that you could not keep them, that you are a sinner and that you are, need a Savior. And why does John, in 1 John 3, 22, say, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Why does Paul in Ephesians 3.17 say that Christ dwells in your hearts by faith? And why does 1 John 3.24 say that he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him? Why does Paul in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13 say that we who are members of the body of Christ have been forgiven all trespasses in Christ? And 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I ask you again, does Paul and John preach the same message? Why did Jesus Christ tell the 12 disciples to begin at Jerusalem? But when Paul was saved, God told him to get out of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 22. Why was it in the early chapters of Acts, the kingdom believers had lack of nothing? But after they stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7, they became poor and offerings had to be taken for those believers, those saints that were at Jerusalem to support them. If Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, according to Romans chapter 11, verse 13, who were Peter, James, and John apostles to? Why does Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 15 that we no longer know Christ after the flesh? What are the two main divisions in your Bible? The answer is not Old Testament and New Testament. There was a secret revealed to Paul only after he was saved. What was the secret that was revealed to him alone? How long had that secret been hidden or kept secret? Where was the secret kept or where was it hid? Why did Paul say that he was not sent to baptize? Why is it that in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, the Bible says about Jesus that the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. But in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 6 says that Jesus Christ gave his life a ransom for all. Why do the Gospels say he's a ransom for many? Paul says he's a ransom for all. Why do the Jews require a sign, but members of the body of Christ walk by faith and not by sight? Why does Paul say in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it, until the day of Jesus Christ. But Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 says, If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. 
of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Why does Paul say that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, until the rapture? But in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it says that if someone falls away, it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. Why does Paul say in Romans 8, 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor thing present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. But Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 says that there is a dog that returns to his vomit and a pig that returns to her wallowing in the mire. <coughs> If there are any of these questions that you can't answer, please contact the person who gave you the DVD. And hopefully we'll get some of these questions answered. Just to be fair, I know the answer to every one of the questions that I asked. I asked the questions because I know the answers. That's how I came up with the questions. But there are simple answers to these questions. And I will give you one hint as to how to arrive at a very simple and logical answer to each of these questions that seem to be saying different things. They are saying different things. And I'll give you the hint. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 15. That's your hint. Now I'm not going to give you the answer because this DVD is entitled, I have a question for you. Or maybe it should be, I have a few questions for you. But like I said at the beginning, this is not designed to create confusion. This is designed to take away the confusion. Because I know that there are many Christians who have thought of these questions before. And rather than try to answer them the wrong way, they say to themselves, well, there must be something that I'm not understanding. There must be something that I'm not reading right. Because I believe the Bible. I believe the Word of God. And I know that there are no contradictions in the Bible. And yet, we have these questions... And these verses in the Bible that say just the opposite. And it was when I understood what 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 meant that the light came on and understanding and how to answer these questions became evident. So I'm going to stop because all I wanted to do was present these questions to you. And they're questions that you must answer. And if you will be honest, you won't make up an answer and hope that it will satisfy. Because I know that many people will put a DVD like this in the hands of their pastor and say, answer these questions, please. And they may come up with some pseudo, you know, questions that hopefully will propitiate your, your thirst but unless it's a right biblical answer, it won't satisfy. It won't sa False answers to these questions won't satisfy. The only thing that will satisfy a Christian is knowing how to study their Bible according to God's design of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And when you do that, all these questions go away and everything in the Bible has a place. Amen?
Lord, we thank you that we could ask questions, meaningful questions, relevant and pertinent questions, and pray that anyone who listens to this will say, well, I wonder what the answer is to some of those questions, and be diligent in seeking them out on their own, or maybe even humbling themselves and saying, I don't know the answer to that question. What is it? And then hopefully we can help someone to grab a better understanding of the Word of God. So we pray these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.